tons to low Earth orbit, or LEO. That's more than two times uh, what Saturn V could lift. The spaceship, which sits atop the booster, will be 162 feet tall and 56 feet wide and will have nine raptors of its own. The booster will launch the spaceship to Earth orbit, then return to make a soft landing at its launch site, which is currently envisioned to be Launch Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The spaceship will lift off with little, if any, fuel on board to maximize the payload, people, cargo, or a combination of both that the craft is able to carry to orbit. An ITS booster will therefore launch again, topped with a tanker, and rendezvous with the orbiting spaceship to fill its tank in space. Then, when the timing is right, Earth and Mars align favorably for interplanetary missions just once every 26 months. The spaceship portion of the ITS will turn its engines on and blast from Earth orbit toward the Red Planet. The spaceship will be capable of transporting at least 100 and perhaps as many as 200 people, Musk said. It will also likely feature movie theaters, lecture halls, and a restaurant, giving the Red Planet pioneers a far different experience than that enjoyed by NASA's Apollo astronauts on their way to the moon. They were, of course, crammed into a tiny little capsule. It'll be, like, really fun to go, Musk said. You'll have a great time. So let's say uh, I I was able to kind of dig up some uh, clips here from this uh, September uh, conference uh, that uh, he spoke at, and I pulled up the whole presentation deck that we'll go through here in uh, a little bit, just in a quick uh, kind of rapid-fire way. Uh, the presentation itself that he gave was over an hour, and I've got a little bit of a clip here that we're going to kind of dig into together to learn a little bit about the context from the man himself, Elon Musk. Who named the guy Elon? Hi, right, so thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, look forward to talking about the SpaceX um, Mars architecture, and what I really want to try to uh, achieve here is to make Mars seem possible, uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes, um, and that you can go. And, and is there really a way that, that anyone could go if they wanted to? I think that's, that's really the important thing. So, I mean, first of all, why go anywhere, right? Um, the, I, I think, there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, I, I don't have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but there's, it's eventually history suggests there will be some, some doomsday event. Uh, the alternative is to become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Yes? Cher agrees. That's what we want. Yeah. He's pointing at a picture of uh, Mars and a person floating in the space capsule. So how do we figure out how to, how to take you to Mars um, and, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that... Um, it's not merely an outpost, but could become a planet in its own right, um, and for us, thus we could become a truly multi-planet species. Uh, th- th- there, are, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why, why Mars? Um, well, um, just to sort of put things into perspective, this is this is what this is an actual scale of what the solar system looks like. So we're we're currently in the, the third little rock from the left. Uh, that's Earth. The sun is um, huge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, and, and our goal is to go to the fourth rock on the left. It's like a tiny pebble. Uh, that's Mars. Um, but you can get a sense for the real scale of the solar system, how big the sun is, of Jupiter, um, Neptune, uh, you know, Saturn, Uranus, and then the little guys on, on the right are Pluto and friends. I can barely see them. This, this sort of uh, helps see it not, not quite to scale, but it gives you a better sense for, for where things are. Uh, so our options for, for, going to, for, for becoming a multi-planet species within our solar system are, uh, are limited. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of nearby options, we've, we've got Venus, uh, but Venus is a high pressure, a super high pressure, hot acid bath. Um, 
So that, that would be a tricky one. Uh, Sounds Venus fun. is not at all like um, the, the, the goddess. This is not <laughs> in no way similar to, to, to the actual goddess. Um, in case so, you were wondering. Uh, it really difficult to make things work on Venus. Uh, Mercury is also way too close to the sun. Um, we could go potentially on the Mar one of the on the one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much further from the sun, a lot harder to get to. It really leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planet civilization, and that's that's Mars. Um, we could conceivably go to our moon, um, and I certainly have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it's it's challenging to create a, uh, a become multi-planetary on the moon because it's it's much smaller than than, than a planet. Uh, it doesn't have any atmosphere. It, it's not as resource rich as Mars. Um, it's got a 28 day day, whereas the Mars day is 24 and a half hours. Um, and it, in general, Mars is, is far better suited to ultimately scale up to be a self sustaining civilization. So, just to give some uh, comparison between. So, uh, for those of you thinking that we were going to land and live on the moon, uh, basically, I think what he's saying is been there, done that. Uh, that's so 20th century. What's wrong with you people? Uh, but I've got a copy of the entire presentation that he went through. It was over an hour long uh, presentation. We'll just do a quick fast forward through this, though, and hit some of the highlights of this. You can also download it, too, at SpaceX.com slash Mars. Uh, but they've got a side-by-side -side comparative comparison of uh, Earth to Mars in terms of, uh, you know, diameter, average distance from the sun, temperature range. Uh, so, for instance, on Earth, it can get as low as 126 degrees Fahrenheit to as high as 138 degrees Fahrenheit. In contrast, uh, on Mars, negative 285 degrees Fahrenheit up to 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That's interesting. You can actually get to 88 degrees uh, there on Mars. So uh, what a nice, balmy, summery day that would be. Um, in terms of uh, diameter, the diameter of Earth is about 8,000 miles. The diameter of Mars is about half that at uh, 4,200. Uh, but in terms of land mass, uh, Mars is 97% of the land mass of Earth. So in terms of weight uh, or mass, uh, Mars is just about as heavy as Earth, even though Earth is twice as uh, wide. Um, in terms of uh, the cost of the trip to Mars, well, today the cost uh, would be in, uh, infinite, uh, money, uh, because it's just not possible. So uh, no matter how much money you have, uh, if you want to go, you can't afford to go because there's no way to go today. But they're working on that. And uh, soon, using traditional methods, those that want to go, uh, compared to those that can afford to go, well, the cost of a trip to Mars using traditional methods as we put these things together uh, over the next couple of years, well, it would be about $10 billion per person. Uh, I'm going to go be outside, uh, let's see, Wall Street with a cup, collecting some change there on the streets for my ticket. It's going to take me a while, though. What, what's really needed is for the cost of the trip to Mars to get down to about the median cost of a house in the United States. And these guys at SpaceX, Elon Musk, has a plan for doing that uh, by improving the cost per ton to Mars by 5 million percent. Uh, how are they going to do that, you might ask? Well, Elon Musk goes through it. Full reusability of products, refilling fuel in orbit, uh, propellant production on Mars itself, and picking the right propellant. This is the big, the big technological advance here. I guess it's more of a chemical advance. Uh, but in terms of full reusability to make Mars trips possible on a large enough scale to create a self-sustaining city, uh, full reusability is essential. They need to be able to send that spaceship to Mars and get the same spaceship back from Mars and vice versa. They need to be able to refill in orbit so they can get the thing off the ground here uh, from Earth, because that's really kind of the expensive propellant portion. Uh, once in orbit, they can send a second spaceship up to refill the first one. Uh, and that's the way that they're looking to do a, kind of a refill here. Uh, not refilling in orbit would require a three-stage vehicle at five to ten times the size of what they've already identified, and it's already bigger than even the Saturn V uh, by over threefold. Uh, spreading the required lift capacity across multiple launches substantially reduces development costs and compresses the schedule. Uh, combined with reusability, refilling uh, makes performance shortfalls an incremental rather than exponential cost increase. 
Creating propellant on Mars is the secret here, too. It allows reusability of the ship and enables people to return to Earth easily. Leverages resources readily available on Mars, and bringing return propellant requires approximately five times as much mass departing Earth. So that just wouldn't be uh, the, the best approach. So they've got to determine the right propellant, and they kind of go through a bunch of different gases here. And as it turns out, um, you know, the the only two that they came up with that could handle uh, the vehicle size that they're talking about is kerosene, uh, which is something easily made here on Earth, uh, and deep cryomethalox, uh, which is not possible, I'm sorry, which is possible to make on Mars. Uh, in terms of the ability to produce kerosene on Mars, well, sorry folks, uh, not possible. Uh, kerosene is a C12 H22.402 versus uh, the deep cryomethalox is a CH402, uh, much more uh, readily available on Mars to produce there. Uh, so they're talking again here about uh, full reusability, refilling in orbit, propellant production on Mars, and the right propellant. They've got a picture of the system architecture. Imagine a giant space rocket on Earth to get the spaceship itself off the ground into space. Imagine doing that exact same thing again with the booster rocket, sending another one up there with extra fuel, refueling in space, then shooting off in a fourth step uh, where the ship heads to Mars, uh, arriving on Mars, landing safely and softly so that the, the ship can uh, be reused again, of course. And then in the ship itself, having the propellant production plant uh, so that it can build enough fuel to return to Earth, uh, which is step number seven here, that return back to Earth. In terms of the vehicle design and performance, they're talking about a carbon fiber primary structure, densified CH402 propellant, and autogenous pressurization. In terms of vehicles by performance, they kind of have a whole list of all the different rockets that are out there. And this Mars vehicle from SpaceX is uh, certainly much bigger than the Saturn V, biggest rocket ever. Uh, it is, for instance, in terms of gross liftoff mass, it's 3.5 times the Saturn V, the largest uh, rocket ever. It's built and powered by uh, Raptor engines. Uh, they go into details here if you want to dig into this on the PDF. Uh, they go into the rocket booster specs itself. Uh, the length of the booster is 77.5 meters by 12 meters wide. Uh, they've got a nice cross-section of the booster that shows the configuration of the engine. Uh, they talk about the interplanetary spaceship. This is the ship that the people are going to be traveling in, yourself, myself included, perhaps. Uh, then they talk about the ship capacity with full tanks and how far and the payload and all those kind of things. They talk about the heat, the heat shield on the spaceship for arrival, uh, both in terms of arrival on Mars as well as arrival back on Earth. Earth. They go into details of the propellant plant itself on terms of how they're going to produce the fuel to return to Earth while uh, being situated there on uh, Mars. And uh, who's paying for this thing? Well, according to uh, Elon Musk, it's going to be a combination of uh, steel underpants, uh, launch satellites, uh, send cargo and astronauts to ISS, uh, Kickstarter, and profit. Uh, so it looks like they're looking uh, to actually make money off this business. In terms of the timeline, they started this uh, crazy little adventure back in 2002. Uh, 2006, they had some uh, launch attempts. They've got other milestones here in 2008, 2010, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, uh, where they've been testing out these boosters, sending them up, bringing them back, landing them in various places at sea, on land, etc. In the future, though, what they're talking about is next steps in terms of getting there. They're going through lots of testing cycles, and they're hoping... By uh, end of 2022, that's only six, seven years away, uh, for Mars flights to begin. And Red Dragon, I believe, is the uh, first flight attempt here that they're talking about. The mission objectives, learn how to transport and land large payloads on Mars. To identify and characterize potential resources such as water. Uh, to characterize potential landing sites, including identifying surface hazards demonstrating key surface capabilities on Mars. Uh, they're currently doing all sorts of Raptor firing tests right now, carbon fiber tanks uh, that they're working with, and then they start uh, dreaming even beyond Mars. Uh, you know, flying this uh, crazy spaceship around Jupiter, landing on the moons there like Enceladus and uh, Europa, uh, then taking this ship on a, a nice tour of Saturn. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, these guys, man, they got their uh, head in the stars. I love it. Uh, well, that, my friends, is uh, how Cher uh, can, in fact, uh, fulfill her campaign promise 
of uh, leaving the planet if Donald Trump got elected. Uh, hell has frozen over. It happened. Or I should say Mars has frozen over. It happened. And, uh, you know.